Okay. So let's start with talking about some strategies for taking the real estate licensing test. Um, and first of all, you need to understand that most of the people that take the real estate exam don't pass it. The, we know from statistics from the Department of Real Estate that they issue less than 50% of the number of licenses compared to the number of people taking the test. In other words, if you have a thousand people taking the test over a period of time, they issue fewer than 500 licenses. Now, this, those, that means that the failure rate is about 50%, but that includes people that have taken it again and again and again and again. Some of those people, they have failed before. Um, I have a guess that someplace in the 60 to 70% of all the people that take the test fail it on their first try. Right? And I, I've come to this conclusion because I get a list every week of people taking the state exam and I see the same names again and again and again and again and again. And again. Now, one of the questions to start with is of the maybe 70% who fail on the first try, though more than 50% who fail every time they give the test, what percentage of those people, the ones that failed, were able to successfully complete those three online open book, cheat as much as you want to college level courses? How many of these people got through the college level program? And the answer is they all did. Yeah. Right. You understand 100 percent of those people that failed the real estate exam had the three college credits from somewhere because they won't even let you take the test. Right. My point is, is that doing the three college courses doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get a real estate license. So why do people fail? Right. Why do people fail? They've gone through the three college courses. They were able to pass those. Well, first of all, people fail because they never learned or retained. Those are really two different things. The necessary information. The college level courses are not designed to give you the information you need to pass the real estate exam. A lot that's in it isn't on the test, and there's a lot that's on the test that isn't in those college courses. And then you have to retain it, right? Even if you were exposed to the information, which a lot of people aren't, you have to remember it long enough to go take the test. Another reason that people fail is they have poor exam skills. The, the truth is some people do well on tests simply because they do well on tests. And some people don't do well on tests because they just don't do well on tests, right? You understand that, that the two of us could have the same amount of real estate information and one of us might pass and the other one might fail, not because you knew more than I did, but you were better at taking tests. We're gonna talk about what we can do to increase your score, even if you don't know any more about real estate. And then psychological, I think the technical term is choking. Right. You know, the pressure you're driving there, you're uh, upset and nervous and there's traffic and you're late. And there, it, it's a, yeah, um, we'll talk about things you can do with that, too. So the format of the state exam, um, first of all, the Department of Real Estate writes and administers their own questions. This is actually important to know. Some of the materials that are sold on the Internet and elsewhere to help you pass the state exam come from companies that are doing it nationally. And most states have a separate system for taking the exam. In other words, I used to do these courses in Nevada. Nevada is a more typical state. In Nevada, you take two exams. You take a national sort of generic real estate test, and then you take a test in Nevada law. So if I go to Nevada and I pass, and then I want to go to, let's say, Texas within a couple of months, I don't have to take the national test again. I can just transfer that to Texas, take the Texas test. Right? You, you see where I'm going. I could go to Illinois, right? And I wouldn't necessarily need to take the national test. I could just take the Illinois test as long as I did it within a certain period of time. California does not use that system. California is the only major state that does not use that system. They write their own test questions. And I'm going to pull this up as we go along, but we know they ask questions deliberately, I would say, on the exam that you will get wrong if you give the national answer. Right? You understand? You'll get it wrong because we they, they're picking at things that California is different, right? And they're writing their own test and they want you to know that. We don't know exactly how many questions the Department of Real Estate has. I have a guess that it's over 3,000. 
Um, having said that, there are some tasks that are used more often and in some questions that appear on more tests, hence the ability to do something like this. The tests are qualifying in nature, they're not competitive. In other words, they don't grade on the curve, right? You understand, technically, everyone could pass or everyone could fail, right? If you get 105 out of 150, you've passed. It doesn't matter what the other people are doing. Having said that, however, um, there's also no quota on new licensees. Um, the, I've had people say this to me, I hear that they fail everybody the first time, that there's too many real estate agents, and so they're deliberately failing people. Um, they, there is no quota on how many licenses they're going to give, but they are trying to fail people. If you read the real estate bulletin put out by the real estate commissioner, they brag about how many people they fail and talk about they want to make it harder and fail more people. The test bank is occasionally, that's a word to emphasize, updated to reflect changes in law and policy. Generally, they don't test stuff that's happened in the last five years. Right, you don't need to be reading the new tax law. Oh my gosh, I need to know. No, you don't need to know the new tax law, right? Because it, it, the department, think of the Department of Motor Vehicles, right? That's what these people are like. And it takes a long time for them to retool. I'm just saying. <laughs> they tend to ask questions about things that don't change, like FHA loan limits change. So they don't ask about them, right? VA loan limits change, right? If they asked a question, they know they'll have to change it at some point so they don't ask those questions. Um, they maintain a history, this is my view at least, so, because these are all computer graded tests and basically it allows them to identify what percentage of people pass any particular question or fail it. So, if you have that information in the database, can you understand how it's easy for them to assemble a test that fails the percentage of people they're planning on failing, right? Because they know how many people get each question right. Um, the exam is 150 multiple guess, I, I mean multiple choice. Uh, um, questions A, B, C, D, right? No um, essay questions, no true false questions, no fill in the blank. You have to get 70% of the questions right in order to pass, which is 105 out of 150. And if you really want, if you're really confident and you want to mess with their minds, um, just answer the first 105, right? And then throw the, you know, because why waste your time? That's all you need. Um, that's why, anyhow, a sarcastic remark. Now, does 70% sound like a high score to require for somebody to get a real estate license? Does that sound like a high score? Right? It didn't to me. Then, yeah, I mean, well, think of it, sure, if, uh, if you're laying on the operating table, and your brain surgeon came in and told you that he passed the brain surgeon's exam by getting 70% of the questions right. That wouldn't sound so good, right? You understand he missed more than one out of every four questions they ask about brain surgery. That doesn't sound so good. So you don't have to be a brain surgeon to get a real estate license. Think of some of them you have met, right? You understand there must be at least one real estate agent you've met by now whose face you can call to mind and say to yourself, if they pass this test, <laughs> I think I can pass this test. Well, I would think they, they try to do that, or lower, lower those score them to pass so that those who really are outstanding can kind of distinguish themselves if they're... No, they don't mess with the score. They have no idea what the... Okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and what this gets at is the question of... Um, the difference between a valid test and a consistent test. So the Department of Real Estate test is a consistent test. By consistent, I mean they fail the same percentage of people just about every time they give the test. Mm -hmm. Valid would mean that this test was an accurate indication of your likelihood to succeed in real estate. You understand, this is not a valid test. In fact, there's an inverse relationship. Think of anyone who gets all these questions right they're a twisted and deviant person, right? You understand, they, they'll probably never make any money in the business because they can't get along with people. And yet I've known people that have failed the exam three or four or five times and went on to be very successful. Mm -hmm. This is testing a certain type of knowledge in a certain way, not necessarily connected to being successful in the business. You get three hours and 15 minutes, which is one minute and 12 seconds per question. Each item is equally weighted. There's you just, they're all equal. 
preparing for the exam, I'm going to give you a bullet outline, which is part of my, my materials, which is keywords and phrases that appear on the state exam as correct answers. I thought about making a list of all the wrong answers, and then I realized that was insane. Um, but you notice I wrote, you cannot be too familiar with this handout, right? You're going to have a copy of it. You should read it over and over and over and over again. You should do practice questions. They're not going to have you write an essay. They're not going to have you stand up and give an oral report in front of class. They're going to ask you A, B, C, D, pick the best answer, multiple guess questions. The more you practice in applying what you know in that format, the stronger you'll be, right? Because that's how they're going to ask you. And most of the test is vocabulary, right? Most of the test is vocabulary, Latin words, and the, and some of the things they do is they'll make up words, they'll make up stuff, and and they have somebody I think is good at this because they have like impressive sounding gibberish, and what you need to be careful of is don't pick something you've never heard of before. Even if it sounds cool, like, well, oh, that really sounds just exactly right. I'm going to pick it. If you've never heard of it before, don't pick it, right? Um, and you just need to go over words and definitions. Um, mental preparation, you should have some goals and stick to them. In other words, how, many, how, much, how much time are you going to spend on a daily, weekly basis? Um, cramming right before doesn't necessarily work that well. Um, you know, and you should try to get a good night's sleep. Common sense. Studies show that you are best if you're slightly hungry and slightly cold when you're taking a test. So get a good night's sleep, eat lightly, include protein, dress in layers. The department of where you're taking it, it may be cold, and we'll talk about that. Uh, emotional preparation, a little bit of anxiety is okay, but don't, you know, that get the best of you, have a stoic attitude, right? You understand this is not a test of your intelligence or your ability to be successful. Be determined what's the worst that can happen. You pay $60 and take the test again, right? You know, um, there's nothing wrong with that. And just because you didn't pass doesn't mean you're failing. There's a difference between failing and quitting. Right, you understand right. what I'm saying? This is, um, you haven't failed yet. If you, you might quit, but you don't fail. Is there a minimum interval between taking tests? Uh, that's a good question. Is there a minimum interval? Maybe. So what it means is, let's say I was taking the test today and I failed. I immediately become eligible to go into e-licensing and schedule another test. Let's say you were planning on taking the test next week, but you chickened out and you reschedule, all of a sudden, pow, there's an opening, I tap it, and I'm taking the test next week, okay. right? Now, it might be that nobody's dropped out and that it's booked for four weeks ahead, right? But there are people that drop out, right? And yeah. so you can, and then all of a sudden, there's an opening and you can jump on it. Sometimes people take it the next week, sometimes a couple of weeks later. Um, plan on doing everything you can to minimize stress. Know where you're going and how to get there. So it, where I'm speaking from right now, which is in San Francisco, the closest is Oakland. The places you can take the test are Oakland, Sacramento, Orange County, uh, San Diego, and Fresno, right? Those are your choices. Um, the one in Oakland is near a BART station, I'm just saying. There's a parking garage right across the street. It's in the state building. No, the Department of Real Estate does not validate parking. I've been asked that question. Um, you go into the state building. The state building is a security building so that you um, take off your shoes, take off your belt, all that stuff, yeah, right? Yeah, in, yeah. in Oakland, yeah. right? And so you, if you have an outfit you wear when you're traveling, you know, wear it. Um, they are super paranoid that you're going to be cheating and or copying their test. You can't have watches. If you have a long sleeve shirt or blouse, they want to see what's up the sleeve. They'll look at your glasses. Um, if you're, if you have a brooch or you can't wear that, I mean, they're, they're super, super paranoid, right? They're going to give you a locker when you get there. At least this is true in Oakland where with a key, you know, the, the little, you know, and you can put stuff in the locker so you can bring a backpack and you can bring stuff and put it in the locker. Right. But I'm just saying, um, so, uh, get there early, you know, rather than late, um, parking right across the, 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 the street almost always has parking. A photo ID is necessary. 
um, if they mailed you one of their letters, bring it, although they have a record of you and, you know, know where you're going, right? If you um, map it out on your cell phone and know where the park and all that kind of stuff, why not? So there's also the way you, you, you sort of wait before you go in and take the test. They put you in this room that's like a holding cell, I guess. And there's oftentimes experts that are there, right? You know, experts are people that have failed five, six, seven times. And they'll be giving out advice, right? You understand? You want to listen to somebody who's failed the test five times, don't you? And they'll be telling you things like, you know, they fail everybody the first time. I don't know if you know this, but it's a, it's a. or um, I hear they're having a new test. Did you know that the, this week there's new tests? Every, you know, things, things like that, hopeful things like that. Um, avoid these people, right? Do you understand? They generally have no idea what they're talking about. You get seated alphabetically, pretty, so it's elbowing your way to the front doesn't necessarily help you they're going to assign you a workstation right and they give you a mouse and you go and you can take the test so you get um well i'll get into that in strategy what you get when you're sitting there and you're looking at a little monitor that comes out of the out of the workstation um there's no keyboard there's a mouse there's a little marker board but there'll be no math right that's coming up there'll be no math and um, they give you a calculator, there'll be nothing to calculate. With the little marker board, you could write out, you know, I don't know, write out memory gimmicks, Maria and, and dust and, and things like that, T-tip and, and things like that. Um, once you're looking at the test, so now you're looking at the test, right? There isn't necessarily a set strategy other than I would go with where you're strong. So for example, you um, can skip questions. So you you look at a question, you're like, I really hate these questions. Uh, or it's a long, rudy question. It's question number 12. And you're like, oh my gosh, I can't. And you're, and you, you know, you, you, you pretty soon beads of sweat start to appear on your forehead and you're, you're, you're getting anxious. Um, just go on to the next question. Now the computer will keep track of the ones you didn't answer. You could start at the end. You could go back and forth. So I generally recommend go through it once by looking at every question. First of all, you might feel good to know they're not asking a capitalization question, right? You know, you might say, oh, goody, you know, or sometimes they actually answer questions with other questions. For example, in the same test, they have a question about, they've had a question basically asking where are termite reports kept? And then later they have a question that actually refers to the state structural pest control board where, you know, termite reports are kept. They actually answered one question with another question. Subsequent. I'm just, yes. Yeah. So uh, go ahead, yeah. right? Um, if you're not strong, go with your strengths, right? So that, because you don't want to run out of time with the ones you know, <laughs> you know, you want to be sure you get those. Um, all questions are equal weight. Answer the ones you know. Skip the ones that are overly difficult. Go back, but answer the ones you know. Um, you can keep notes. You can write down. It's not really scratch paper, but it's a marker board if you want to. Um, but they'll let you know which ones you've skipped when you skip it. It's, oh, I remember now why I put this slide here. Sometimes the Department of Real Estate computer doesn't work. And then they give you number two pencils and Scantron scan cards to fill in with the number two pencils, All right, World War II technology. Skipping becomes more of a challenge because you're not keeping electronic track and you might put number 13 where number 12 is supposed to be, right? You understand, but most exams, unless there's something wrong with their system that day, it's going to be the computer test. Um, and it's not really scratch paper, but they do give you a marker board and sometimes they actually give you paper. But again, most of the time you just get a marker board and you could write out some visuals and things like that. Memory charges. Now, um, be careful, a famous strat strategist, um, Sun Tzu wrote that no plan survives contact with the enemy. Right? You understand, you're going to have to take the test. Be careful and don't argue what ifs, right? We'll go through some examples as we go through questions where, well, what if he didn't sign it? What if he didn't, you know, mean, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, answer each question based on the words that actually can change. We're going to talk about how to analyze 
the, the questions. Um, reading and attack skills. So the question can stick of a stem and four possible responses. Usually in the last sentence of the stem is the task. This is what you need to identify and pay attention to. The task is the heart of the question. It usually has a question mark or a colon. Sometimes if it's a long one, read it first, right? You understand sometimes they give you questions that fill up the screen. It's like a miniature screen. They'd never go on to another screen, but these are really long questions. Sometimes it's better to go to the end and read what it is they want to know about, right? You understand? Because a lot of the information that's in the question, you don't need to know, right? And then by at least if you know what you're looking for, you know, then when you read it, you can have that in mind. So there is a stem and a stem and a stem, and, and then there's a task, right? And then there are responses. Um, if the question has a negative task, one of the things we're gonna talk about is you need to have in your mind, I'm looking for a true statement or I'm looking for a false statement about this, right? And sometimes they, they jumble it up so you have to have that in your mind. I'm looking for a false statement about easements. Okay, and look. Um, question formats, look out for words with negative modifiers like not, except, false. Sometimes they highlight them on the test, right? Some, just to be fair, I guess. So if there is one negative modifier, like none, not, except, false, those are negative modifiers. If there's one, we're usually looking for something false. Which of the following is false regarding real property? Which is, all of the following are true except, right? What, what is not true about real property, right? So if we have a negative modifier, we're looking for a false statement. And really a A, B, C, D multiple guess question is really four true false questions, right? And sometimes they're looking for something true and sometimes they're looking for something false. And sometimes you have to wonder what are they looking for? When they ask you questions like, well, all of the following are true except we're looking for something false. All of the following are false except. Well, false and except sort of cancel each other out. There's two negative modifiers. We're looking for something true. None of the following are false except, right? All you have to do is count the negatives. None, false, except. One negative false, two negative true, three negative false, right? You understand if there's an uneven number of negatives, then we're looking for a false statement. Um, you need to, there's unlikely to be any arithmetic questions, unlikely, right? If whoever was teaching you real estate license preparation spent a lot of time on math, they don't know what they're doing, right? That's all I'm going to say, right? You know how much time I spent on arithmetic, right? 640. Yeah. So, but you do need to know these numbers. They will ask you how many square feet are in a mile, 43,560. They will ask you, this, I'm talking about, I talked to people who took the test this last week, how many feet are in an acre? I mean, how many feet are in a mile? 5,280, how many square feet are in an acre? And it's 43,560. And they want you to know that there are 640 acres in a section, right? Yeah. These, these aren't Sections arithmetic questions, mm -hmm. right? These aren't arithmetic questions. No. These are simply, you, they want you to know. So, by the way, uh, my memory gimmick for the number of square feet in an acre, right? 43,560 is the number of square feet in an acre. This is my memory gimmick for remembering that. You have to remember this sequence of numbers. Three, four, five, six. I hope I haven't lost anybody yet, right? Well, if you can remember three, four, five, six, what you do is switch the first two and add a zero, right? And that's 43,560. Well, sometimes when I share that with people, they were like, you know, um, thanks a lot, you know, because if I could remember to do all that, I could have just remembered how many square feet, you know, are in an acre. But sometimes the way our minds work, it's easier to remember three, four, five, six, and know you have to do something to it than four, three, five, six. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. um, there are no trick ants to trick questions on the state exam. Well, there might be one or two, but um, just because something is true doesn't mean it's the correct answer. Right, you understand it has to be true in relationship to the task that they gave you. We're going to look at some examples of that. Um, a lot of times they're not asking you for the best 
um, possible answer, they're asking you to pick the best answer among the four choices. And some people find that frustrating because sometimes they're, the answer that you need to pick is the one that is most right or least wrong, right? And that's sort of, you know, but, but you know, least wrong. Um, and so I s isolate the task of the question as accurately, accurately as you can and before we look at the answers. And so, really well. All right. So you're about to uncover some unfamiliar terms. Um, try not to go with some term you're unfamiliar with. Right? We're going to, um, they do ask questions about Latin, but if you haven't heard about it in your principal's books or in my classes, um, don't fall for it, right? Because sometimes they just throw stuff in. Guessing. This is how you can increase the number that you're going to get right without knowing any more about real estate. Isn't that what we all want? That's what we came to hear. So um, you're going to encounter at least a few questions where you have no idea. Don't panic. Guess, right? It's normal. Now, if you can, sometimes they have like two close answers and two stupid ones, right? So at least now you're down to 50-50, right? You, you, if you, you can miss more than one out of every four questions, more, and still pass this test, right? You understand? If, you're, if, you're, if you have a certain solid body that you can get right, and now you're down to 50-50 on some of them, right? You know, that's your, your, your chances are higher. Um, you're not expected to get a perfect score, and if you do, you're weird, and, and, and they won't even tell you, right? They only tell you if you fail what your score is. Functional indicators are flags, things that are not related to the subject matter that might give us an idea as to what the right answer is. So, um, and like flags, these aren't perfect, but one of the, one of the, things that we've noticed is that the longer answers are typically right. right? When the person who's writing the test question um, puts a lot of time into writing one of the choices, they seem to put in more time writing the right answers than the wrong answers. Right Now, I, just to be clear, these are not absolutes. If you know the answer, pick the answer. I'm talking about what if you don't have a clue as to what the answer is, all things being equal, longer answers tend to be right. right. Qualifiers and absolutes, look out for things like always, all, none, and never, any. Look out for absolute words. Absolute words, well, very few things are always true. Isn't that true? Mm -hmm. In fact, couldn't we say that absolute statements are always wrong? Couldn't we say that? Well, then that would be wrong, right? So an absolute statement isn't always wrong, but they're more often to be wrong. Yeah. Um, all of the above and none of the above, this may seem like common sense, but if you know that one of the answers is not right, don't pick all of the above, right? <laughs> one would think, <laughs> right? And if you know that two are right, pick all of the above if you're uncertain about the third. None of the above is virtually never the right answer. I'm just saying, if you don't know the answer, do not guess none of the above, right? Guess something else. Don't guess none of the above. Um, synonymous answers, if two answers have the same meaning, neither of them is correct. The computer that will grade your exam won't grade me right if I pick A on the question and you right if you pick B on the question. That's not how the computer works. There's only one right answer. So if two choices basically say the same thing, neither of them are, are true, right? And if you have two opposites, chances are high one of them is true, right? If real property and personal property is a choice, chances are one of them is true, right? Even if you don't know what we're talking about. Is that right? So this is a question that was asked on the broker test at one point in time. And I use this as an example because it is a real estate question, right? I'm not kidding. And my guess is you don't have a clue as to what it's actually asking about. And the question on the broker exam was what essentially was a incorporeal eruditament? That's what the question, a incorporeal eruditament. And they gave you these for, this is want to become a broker? Huh? These were the four choices.
Because A was personal property, B was real property, C was chattel, D is none of the above. Now, I, this is a broker question. That's why I know you probably haven't thought about this very much. Um, but it's a real estate question. Incorporeal means not made of matter or conceptual, I would say. Um, I don't know what the name, the word eridivit. Well, let's say that you can't figure out what the words mean because you don't know any Latin. Right, you, you might know that a corpse is a body, so yeah. that the incorporeal you might have guessed. So incorporeal eruditament means a, a writer interest in property capable, an intangible writer interest in property ca capable of being inherited. How about this? Um, what is the difference between chattel and personal property? Explain to me what the, what's the difference. Mm, I don't think there is. Any. There is no difference, no, right? Exactly. Chattel is another word for personal property. So that means it can't be A or C, right? Yeah. You understand? Because if it was A, then C would be true. If it was C, then A would be true. Did I say if there are two opposites, one of them is probably true? Is there something opposite to personal property? Real property. Real property. Yeah. And did I suggest that you pick none of the above if you're not sure? I said don't yeah. ever pick none of the above, <laughs> right? So mm -hmm. the answer is real property, yeah. right? Because it has to be, that. right? It has to be, right? because of the way they worded it. Now, incorporeal means an intangible, not of the body. Eruditament is a writer interest. An easement is a type of incorporeal eruditament. It's right? a bundle of it, it's, yeah. Of an easement is intangible, uh -huh. the right to use somebody else's property, and you could inherit it. Yeah. That's and, it. Okay. Right. Okay. Anyhow. Yeah. So, but my, my point was about how you can find the right answer, right? Now, don't guess by answer choice distribution. You know, that the answer choice distribution method of guessing is I come to 12, number 12, I don't know what the answer is, and I say to myself, you know, I haven't had a B in a long time, right? You understand? And, and then, I, so I pick B thinking, well, you know, it's B's turn, and then 13 is B and 14 is B and 15, and I go, ooh, too many Bs, right? And so then I back out that B and I look and I say, well, you know, what, what's missing in the distribution here? There, there aren't any A's. That assumes that there, um, there's an equal distribution of answer choices. In other words, that an equal number, of A is correct and B is correct and C is, and that is not true. We know that C and D are right more often than A and B. They're right more often, right? Yes. And so, if you're guessing, right, you know, um, and you don't have any of these other indicators, um, I tell people pick C, right? just pick C. After the exam, um, try not to leave too early. Proofread your work, but be careful. Um, correct only obvious mistakes if you don't change your guesses. Right, so you, don't people change. don't change your guesses. Yeah. Go with your first guess. And so many times people said, "Well, I picked this, and then I went back and I changed it." And I said, "You changed it from the right answer to the wrong answer." Don't second guess your guesses. Now, if you miss something in the question because you were going quicker, that's different, right? But don't change your guesses. All right. Yeah. More often than not, I think is.